General MacArthur watched from a distance as his forces crumbled in November 1950. Korea would be his final crusade, and a resounding victory there would have assured his immortality. But that victory, imminent just days ago, was slipping away. His frustration was immeasurable, and most of it was directed at the Truman administration. Truman had limited MacArthur's resources to prevent him from attacking China. He imposed airspace restrictions that forbade U.S. fighters from chasing Chinese planes beyond the Korean border. And he limited the amount of manpower and equipment that was sent to the front. MacArthur found these restraints crippling. On November 28th, he sent a message of warning to the Pentagon. We face an entirely new war. Our present strength of force is not sufficient to meet this undeclared war by the Chinese. This command has done everything humanly possible within its capabilities, but now is faced with conditions beyond its control and its strength. General MacArthur. The relationship between the president and his general, never entirely cooperative, was disintegrating as quickly as the UN's field position. Like its advance two months earlier, the UN's retreat gathered momentum as it went. The mass exodus of soldiers was eclipsed only by that of petrified North Korean civilians. Thousands were eager to defect. Their restlessness may have been inspired by UN-sponsored leaflets like these that were airdropped over North Korean villages. The leaflets warned of the dangers of communism and touted the freedom of Western ideals. Disgruntled with their treatment in North Korea, thousands fled south. Meanwhile, the Chinese charge continued. As Christmas approached, UN morale was desperately low. The men resented the limitations being imposed by Washington. Their complaint, which would be echoed 15 years later in another Asian conflict, was that they weren't being allowed to use their superior force to win the war. They, like their general, thought that if they only had better support, they could have spent Christmas in Kalamazoo instead of Korea. To make matters worse, two days before Christmas, their field commander, General Walker, was killed in a jeep accident. The fearless leader, who'd once told his troops, if I ever see you back here, it had better be in a coffin, would go home in one himself. Walker's successor was Matthew B. Ridgway, a proven leader who understood MacArthur's zest for conquest and Washington's wavering enthusiasm. He'd served in both climates. In World War II, he commanded an airborne division over Italy. Later, he served at the Pentagon. His level-headed wisdom brought a vital balance to the battlefield. When he arrived at the front, Ridgway was startled by the somber mood. He wrote to a colleague. It was clear to me that our troops had lost confidence. I could read it in their eyes, in their walk. I could read it in the faces of their leaders, from sergeants right on up to the top. There was a complete lack of that alertness that aggressiveness that you find in troops whose spirits are high. General Ridgway. The Chinese onslaught only added to their misery. By New Year's Eve, the Red Army had crossed the 38th parallel and was closing in on Seoul. Ridgway ordered a retreat back to the Han River, except for an arc around Seoul. There, his troops were clinging to the northern fringes of the city. But they couldn't hold out for long. Seven Chinese armies were stampeding straight for Seoul, and once again, the UN was overwhelmed. On January 3rd, Seoul fell for the second time, and by the next day, the UN line had dropped 35 miles south of the capital, well below the Han River. The troops were almost back to square one, in the four months since they'd last been here, all they'd gained were casualties. 
Luckily, breakthroughs in war medicine were keeping many of those casualties alive. <laughs>